Yes, yes. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Welcome into Spillin' Party. It's driven by Munganess St. Louis Ack, your Munganess Burkhardt Alton Toyota. My name is Timothy Michael McKernan. Uh, and that's Jackson Burkett. Jackson, uh, a little emotional today because this is the last balloon party for a week. I'm emotional, personally. Well, with us anyway. Right, right. Josh Innes will be filling in for us on Wednesday and Friday. The opening drive is going to do four hours on Thursday as 101 ESPN will be broadcasting live from the Budweiser Brew House inside Ballpark Village this Thursday for opening day. The home opener is finally here. And 101 ESPN will be set up just steps away from Bush Stadium. The opening drive, BK and Ferrario, and the fast lane all coming to you live this Thursday from Ballpark Village. The opening day broadcast brought to you by Swiss Air, Heating and Cooling, Holiday World, and Splash and Safari, and Budweiser. So there you go. Not bad, not bad at all. Yeah. Uh, Jackson, I, so many topics today. The decision for you is, number one, what are you going to call this? Mm, mm-hmm. And number two, what's the lead? I can't wait to hear. So this is Little Pill's Tuesday Topics? Tuesday Topics. Wow. Yeah, and there's so many of them. And the lead story, What are you Tim, going with on the lead? I feel like a team uh, so close with a, with a real path to the playoffs, a treacherous path nonetheless, but a path. It's the fourth easiest schedule in the NHL. Uh, but uh, given the point situation. Got it. It's I mean, a, it got better, though. It's a fairly true. Tra- yeah, after last night. And you that's better why believe I, it, Jack. That's why I want to lead off with the Blues. You're leading with the Blues. I think that's the right call. Yeah. That's the I right mean, you know, five games into a baseball season. Yeah, it's the right play. Uh, the Blues pick up a win against the top team in overtime and take two crucial points and sit just three points out. How do you do? How important of a response was that for the note? And did their play reflect that sense of urgency? And then let's take a look at the pla- path to the playoffs as we stand right now. Um, what a response. I know that is a cliche, but this team, two different times, two different 4-0 results, as a matter of fact, I've thought, okay, that'll wrap her on up. 4 nothing against the Rangers about a month ago, a little less than a month ago, and 4 nothing against the Sharks. Now, the Rangers might hoist the chalice in two and a half months. The Sharks will not be. Mm, no. And that was... Stunning. And then 48 hours later, after they lost to the Rangers, they go into Boston and beat a team that also could be hoisting the chalice in two and a half months in the Bruins. And then last night, they beat a team that could be hoisting the chalice in the Edmonton Oilers. Tough to explain. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you and I were at the game last night, and I was pointing out, look at Columbus beating up on Colorado. Colorado still is playing for something. It's not like Colorado's just packing it in. President's Trophy's up for grabs. Home ice throughout's up for grabs. And they lose to the Columbus Blue Jackets. I think they lost 4-1, to Mm -hmm. 3-1, 4-1. to It can happen. Um, And then the Blues come out and they play a game like that. They're down 1-0. Bunch of goals that... Thought we were going to put them down 2 nothing, Didn't. They bounce back. They tie it. They take the lead. And then they give up a goal with about five minutes left. And you're going, oh, boy. Right as, by the way, because I was monitoring that Winnipeg and L.A. Kings game. Right as you find out that the Kings lost in regulation. So huge. And as the overtime period gets going, Jackson, and you see two guys who you named one time a few months ago and, and you stopped Jamie Rivers in his tracks. You want to you want to tell the people? That's Connor McDavid uh-huh. and that's Leon Dreisaitl. That's right. And they're out there on that three-on-three three in overtime and you're going, oh boy. And they're just dominating in the blue zone. And you're just going, you know it's just going to happen. You just know it's going to happen. I was prepared for it. And waiting for, for 97's arms to go in the air. Mm-hmm. But then alas... Turnover, sod, partial breakaway, five hole. How do you do? Now, two ways to look at this. And how you choose to look at it, that's up to you. I live by this credo. Some people like things and some people don't like other things. To each their own. Mm -hmm. We're pro-freedom. We're anti kink shaming. Those That's are the right. tenets of this program. That's right. You can say they'd be a point back if it weren't for that 
damn Saturday night game against the Shacks. Mm -hmm. And I understand that. But here's the thing. You just went up against a team that has been playing the best hockey as far as winning percentage goes since Thanksgiving. Keep in mind, the Oilers fired their coach uh, early in the season. And you beat them 48 hours after you had one of the most startling performances this team has had in years. And you picked yourself up. And it's the same group of guys that picked themselves up after what wasn't necessarily startling because the Rangers are a very good team, but either way, a 4 nothing loss the day after the trade deadline. And then they go in and they beat the Boston Bruins 5-1. to one. So, Jackson, I am choosing to be grateful that we are going to have something to watch here over the next few nights. And maybe, just maybe, maybe the Blues can get themselves in. And when you look at how they've played against some of the top teams in the league, just, 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 just get in. Just get in. Just give me a sweat. It's Nashville on Thursday night. San Jose, the dreaded Sharks. Mm -hmm. How will they play against the Sharks this time around? You've, I cannot wait yeah, to, to see that. They've gone gangbusters. Uh, and then the Ducks on Sunday in Anaheim. And then back to St. Louis they go where they'll take on the Blackhawks. And you go, wow, minus Nashville, who, by the way, is on a two-game losing streak. Uh, you have three straight favorable opponents. But it's a weird feeling for Blues fans. I'm sure many of you are listening right now at your desk, driving along, and I'm sure many of the single ladies in St. Louis are watching us on YouTube right now and saying, but Tim, it's those games that I expect the Blues to win against the teams that are doormats that scare me the most. I'd rather them play the Bruins, Rangers, and Canucks as opposed to the Sharks and Ducks and then the Blackhawks. And I understand that. But you know what, Jackson? Mm. We don't control that. What we control is our effort, boys. That's right. That's right. Great moments are born from great opportunity. Yeah. And that's what you have here tonight, boys. That's what you've earned here tonight. Probably boys. Boys, yeah. Yeah, I mean, all you can do is play the schedule that's in front of you. You can't replay what's behind you. And so you go out there. And uh, I think that their play last night was a, was a great reflection of that sense of urgency. It's pretty easy for guys to take a look at the path to the playoffs and say, well, we're up against it. I could be well, on the coming golf. off of that Saturday thing. Yeah, right, exactly. Uh, the Kings uh, have the easiest schedule left, by the way. Mm. Uh, a little taste of that. Uh, they have the... Uh, crack it, if I'm not mistaken, tomorrow, and uh, then uh, they got the Sharks. Okay. They got a lot of Sharks left. They got a lot of Ducks left. But you know what? The Kings are something. This I feel like this happens. There's one team at the end that, for whatever reason, falters. I don't know. And then there's a team that surges. It, and I'm not talking about the ones that are at the top of the President's Trophy standings. I'm talking about a team that's going to get in and all of a sudden falters. It looked like it was going to be VGK. I think that win in St. Louis really righted their ship. The Kings might be inexplicably faltering. That was a 3-3 game last night in Winnipeg. Winnipeg scores with about five, six minutes left. Huge for the Blues. And, uh, you know, I saw Saad doing the post-game interview, and he was like, yeah, we're, we're scoreboard watching. We're absolutely scoreboard watching. They knew that they had an opportunity last night, uh, and they took advantage of it. And so let's see what happens on Thursday night in Nashville. Keep an eye on the Predators, by the way, Jackson. I know you're not. I know you're not. I, I, I know that's not what you're doing. I, I call them Smashville. I do know you do that. But whereas the Kings have the easiest schedule, Predators are going to be put to the test, and they've lost two in a row. Take care of what you can control. That's right. I have no idea what the hell happened on Saturday night, but you know what? Still, I think the Blues are 8-2-1 and one in their last 11. 8-2-1. Impressive. Impressive. And, you know, there have been some legitimate opponents in there. Mm -hmm. But strangely, some of their worst periods of play have been against some of their least talented opponents. So... Thursday night, Nashville, Blues, Predators pregame here on 101 ESPN, 6 p.m. It'll be a Jim Dandy, then Blues and Sharks pregame, 4 p.m. It's a 5 o'clock puck drop. Kind of like that. On Saturday. Yeah. And uh, then the Blues and Ducks pregame, 6 p.m. here on 101 
ESPN, and then next week, Blues back at home against the Blackhawks on April 10th. There it is. I've laid it out for you. I mean, Blues and Stars in the first round? Oh, how do you do? Love it. Would love it. Blues and Avalanche? Blues and Canucks? Rematches left and right, Tim, of a it's, famous It's series. a rematch uh, festival is yeah. what it is. Yeah. So, Jackson, do the Blues make the playoffs? No. Good for you. No. Because I, 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 I didn't know what was going on yesterday. <laughs> Well, if like, but, but I guess once we get to the Cardinal conversation, maybe I'll, maybe you'll still be on that. Well, uh, I mean, that, after that, last that night, rights holder. After last night, there was plenty to be happy about. However, uh, the question you just proposed to me is essentially like, even money, do you think the Blues make the playoffs? I would tell you no. Now, if I got some odds, maybe, but right. just given the path that they have, like you said, the Kings and their easy schedule ahead, you know, all the Blues can do is win. But even if they do just that, it's still not completely up to them. They'll control their Game in hand for the Kings. Yeah. That game in hand will be 10 to 2 tomorrow night, and the Blues will be even with them when the Blues are taken on Nashville and the Kings are taken on the Sharks on Thursday. For the record, Money Puck's got the Blues making the playoffs at 3.8% of the time. The Kings, they've got making the playoffs at 94.8% of the time. They've got the uh, Golden Knights at 97.7% and Nashville at 99%. If you believe the Blues will hoist the Stanley Cup in mid-June, and I know a lot of you do, uh, you can put $100 on that and you will be paid $15,000 when they hoist the chalice. And who are they beating? Florida? Is that what you said? They yeah, Matthew Kachuk. Yep. Matthew Kachuk? Yeah. So yep. there it is. There's your, there's your roadmap for the next two and a half months. Mm, Stanley Cup final in Hollywood, Florida. Yep. I think we have to do that. Yeah. We have to go there. Yeah. It will only be 99 degrees with humidity. It's fine with me. We'll get some work in chipping off Bermuda. Tight lies. Right. Tight lies. All right. We'll close out the uh, first segment of the program today, and it's this is called Little Pills Tuesday Topics. That's right. Uh, and we will move to the Cardinals getting a win last night. Kyle Gibson with a Jim Dandy. The old knuckler <laughs> for the Padres didn't have it in what might be his only appearance this year. <laughs> uh, Cardinals getting the win to improve to 2-3. and three, A variety of things that were positive. Positives last night. We will talk about that. That's coming your way here on Balloon Party 101 ESPN. This is Tim McKernan for the Bath Authority. If your bath or shower is old, outdated, has mold, mildew, broken tiles, you got to call the good people at the Bath Authority. The Bath Authority provides the highest quality bathroom remodeling products along with a world-class customer experience. Their modern, durable tubs and showers are designed with an exclusive high-tech polymer liner. What that means to you is it'll be low maintenance, resistant to mold and mildew, easy to clean, and last for decades. Plus, it comes with a lifetime warranty. Walk-in tubs, replacement showers, tub-to-shower conversions, and more. Every unit's custom built. You pick the premium accents and accessories, including safety features like low-profile showers, grab bars, and shower seats. All Bath Authority products are 100% made in the USA and can be installed in as little as one day by certified factory technicians. Call today, 314 314- 347-0410 and get $1,000 off a new shower or bath, plus 36 months of interest-free financing. You are their priority at the Bath Authority. Elevate your bathroom to a new level of luxury, style, and safety. Call today, 314-347-0410 to schedule your free NM estimate today and get $1,000 off a new shower or bath, plus 36 months of interest-free financing. TheBathAuthority.com, a better bath awaits.
Welcome back. This is Balloon Party. My name is Tim McKernan, and you can watch Jackson Burkett and I on YouTube, the 101 ESPN YouTube channel. Uh, Jackson, how's things going in the chat? Because Eric Cleveland's in there talking about the WWE Hall of Fame class. Nice. Tiny Peepee's in there, along with John Scores and Bourbon Snob. Yeah, all the heavy hitters. Yeah. It's like the heads of the families. It's like, it's like they have their own little chat while we're just over here, you know, gabbing. Well, we, we support the expression of all ideas. Yeah. John Stuart Mill, Open Marketplace of Ideas. That's right. Think about that. Yeah, we're a real bastion of, uh, of opinions. Nice. I like that a lot. And that's perfect because today is Little Piddle's Tuesday Topics on 101 ESPN. That's right. Cardinals uh, get a win in which the offense was actually popping with every star starter, sans Victor Scott, who had some issues with runners in scoring position, getting a hit in five of the players with a multi-hit game. What did you think of Kyle Gibson's first star as a Redbird? Did it seem like Nolan Arenado looked more comfortable at the plate? And how about Jordan Walker's diving effort? Uh, I think the thing that uh, stands out to me most is Kyle Gibson, and I don't know how it can't be, and you're not one time through the rotation because you haven't had a Sonny Gray start, but for who the Cardinals have at the moment, uh, we have now seen them all pitch, and minus Miles Michaelis, all of them have been either good or, in the case of Gibson, great, yeah. and that is super exciting. Um, at the same time, I've been doing this uh, in St. Louis for two decades, more than two decades, and uh, it's not like college football or the NFL where you only have uh, so many games. You cannot get too high with highs, too low with lows. Um, but with that said, Gibson's last spring start was outstanding, and Gibson's uh, recent start here in the regular season was outstanding. So that is incredibly encouraging, not just two earned runs and uh, only two walks and four hits, but the fact that he went seven innings really needed considering the spot the Cardinals were in with their bullpen. Yeah. So I am uh, especially anxious to see what Miles Michaelis does tonight. Yes. If there's one, here's one observation, because I'm not going to do the, not to say that people do this, I have no idea that what people say, mm -hmm. um, but if they win, then you go, ah, ah, and if they lose, ah, you hear that, you hear, ah, where are all the Cardinal haters now? And then if they lose, oh, where are the people who are saying the Cardinals have it turned around now? And we do that 162 times. It's just, you know. The one thing that I notice across the board with the team is there is a chip on their shoulder. And this isn't like a, I got to write a column, so let me come up with narrative thing. <laughs> it is pick, pick a guy and, and, and not, not like a Goldschmidt, because that just isn't really the way he works. He's going to be, you know, his heart rate isn't moving, mm -hmm. I don't think. But whether it be Michaelis and what he was saying going into the Dodgers series uh, and what he said coming out of it with the Otani and the making references to gambling, uh, Lance Lynn obviously fired up as he was coming off the mound, striking out the side. Brendan Donovan yeah, last night. Mm -hmm. um, there is a clear chip on the shoulder, us against the world. We know that nobody believes in us. F you mindset on this team. Yeah. Now, as we were making the observation regarding Danny Hurley at UConn, Kirby Smart at Georgia, this is a little played out and transparent when you're talking about teams the caliber of UConn and Georgia football. The Cardinals would not fall into the category of UConn basketball, Georgia football, and so this is a little bit of a different operation to say nobody believes in us because in this case, I don't know if nobody believes in them when it comes to the Central, but as far as being one of the better teams in the National League or American League, for that matter, if you're including all of Major League Baseball, and if you put the Cardinals in the top 10, I don't think many people would. And if that brings them together and motivates them, outstanding. Why do I cite that? Well, because the guy who has been one of the most vocal people gets the ball again tonight, and this time, while he's still going up against a very good lineup, it's not the Dodgers lineup. So I am intrigued to see what we get from Miles Michaelis in his second start of the year. Agreed. I think uh, it's a big bounce-back start for him because 
I, Michaelis is the kind of guy where he's he's going right for the zone. You know, he's not going to mess around. He's trying to keep that pitch count low. And I personally like that. However, when you face a lineup like the Dodgers, you can get eaten alive. And we saw that happen on opening day. But against the Padres, a little different. On Kyle Gibson start last night, you know, the two earned runs. But I think that pitch he threw to Tatis, there's a pretty limited amount of players who can turn on and crank it like he did. You know, that was not a, a bad pitch by any means. Whereas if you compare that to the old knuckler who threw a 79-mile-per-hour meatball to Wilson Contreras they set dead setter it's a little bit different so really encouraging from Gibson's first start and then uh, the offense coming together including Nolan Arenado hitting the ball hard and you know he lined out to third but that play on a lot of hits is going to be a base hit that's going to score a run so encouraging things indeed encouraging things yeah Jordan Walker making a diving catch like that for a guy who struggled and defensively that was awesome that was really cool that is uh that's what you want out of a guy who's just getting his feet under him in right field. The one that, that I would say stands out the most is is Donovan at the top of the order um, to have a table setter there. Uh, so three for four, not only with a home run, but three for four from ben, Brendan Donovan. And then if he can get on base, what that then has a domino effect for Goldschmidt, Gorman, and Arnado and Contreras following him. Uh, another little fun fact for no one tell, if Matt Carpenter would have been comfortable dropping down butts <laughs> five years ago, yeah. what the world would have looked like. I, know. I don't know how many times on how many shows it would get brought up because of the shift at the time, why doesn't he drop down a bunt? And you're just laying them down, just like rolling them out there. Yeah. It's not like you even have to have a great bunt. His bunt last night worked great, super effective, but he popped it up. But when you have nobody over there on the left side of the infield, you can pretty much do whatever you want and get on base. And, yeah, if you can do that once a game where they're going to shift you like that, not only does it get you on base, but it might have them rethink how they shift, which has always been Carpenter's thing. He hits the ball hard. He just hits it right to the defense. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that was great. And, then, yeah, you're right. Like, what would he have looked like four or five years yeah, ago? Yeah, I mean, I don't know how many times you're like, oh, my God, there's nobody <laughs> on the left side of the infield. Just drop it down. Yeah, totally, man. Um, so he was able to do it last night, and that led to a couple of hits for him. Donovan with a big night. Arnato, as you made reference to. Um, so, but the, like I said, the, the, you know, what, what's – if Miles Michaelis is a mess, you got a problem on your totally. hands. So totally. I am this – again, from a big-picture standpoint, you have 162 games. It's 162 games. You can't overreact to too many. You can't underreact. To, it's, it's just, okay, here's what you got. You see it. You assess it. Well, starters, of course, you know, divide that by five. So this is his second start. This is an opportunity to see if – was it about the Dodgers or was it about Michaelis? And, again, this isn't – some random lineup. The Cardinals are going to be put to the test in the first few weeks of the season. It's not like the Padres lineup is poor. I'm anxious to see what Michaelis does tonight. That is, that's a, that's a big thing um, for the Cardinals because I just don't think Kyle Gibson is going to necessarily have number two starter stuff. That was wonderful last night. I don't think that, Hey, if he does, God bless America. For sure. Uh, it's the Cardinals are going to need somebody else to be there. Assuming Sonny Gray is healthy and uh, and that would most likely be Michaelis. Although it's not a lock, but it would most likely be Michaelis. So let's see how he bounces back. Because I'm telling you, that guy's fired up. He's got all the money in the world. He's 35. He can shut her down whenever he wants. But I, I get the sense that the team has a real, it, truly. And it, I, I, it, while I'm saying it, in a way I hate it because how often do you hear that a team has a chip on its shoulder? So it's, it's such a sports media narrative that is overplayed that it becomes cliche. But in the case of the 2024 Cardinals, they truly do have a chip on their shoulder. Right. For whatever reason, that, that, and that can be a tie that binds. So great. Hey, if it worked on the Georgia football team, even though they were ranked number one throughout the year, great. If it works on UConn, even though they've been one of the best teams in college basketball the last couple of years, great. Well, if this brings a group of professionals together uh, in an us-against-the-world mentality, whatever works. But I've that's just been a common theme with all these interviews. I'm, I'm sure, you know, Derek Gould, Katie Wu, John Denton are asking questions that are benign questions, and they get hit with a, you know— a fiery answer and they're probably like where in the hell is this coming from but i think that's the mindset of the team yeah totally man. and if you can come back to st louis i mean best case scenario would be what uh four and three mm -hmm. be wonderful yeah but even three and four considering what you're starting out with hey 
uh, I'll take it. But the bigger thing from a macro standpoint is what you've gotten from your starting pitching. Yep. And that's without what most likely is your best pitcher yet. Um, so Kyle Gibson, super encouraging. Looking forward to uh, what the Cardinals get here from Miles Michaelis. It is 1028 in St. Louis. We will come back with the second half of Balloon Party. Tim McCurden, Jackson Burkett with you. This is 101 ESPN. This is Action Jackson. Willie Sports Center update brought to you by Saliga Heating and Cooling. The Blues win in overtime last night, 3 2 over the Oilers. They will play again on Thursday night, taking on the Nashville Prayers. You can catch that game right here on the home of the Blues, 101 ESPN, pregame at 6 p.m., puck drop at 7 p.m. The Cardinals get a win in San Diego last evening, final score of 6 2. They take on the Padres again tonight, 840 is your first pitch. And last night in the NBA, the Pacers defeat the Nets, 130 
133 to 111. Tyrese Halliburton with 27 points. That was another Sports Center update brought to you by Saliga Heating and Cooling, an independent American standard heating and air conditioning dealer. Welcome back. This is Balloon Party. It's 101 ESPN. My name is Tim McKernan. That's Jackson Burkett. I will be off tomorrow, Thursday, Friday, and Monday. My little sister's getting married, Jackson. We're going out of town. Uh, you will be holding down the fort and breaking down uh, the NBA's MVP race. Well, that's right. Well, congratulations to your sister and your Thank family. You. Thank you. Lovely occasion. Thank Nothing you. Nothing like a wedding. Love a good wedding. Um, the first 40 minutes of Godfather, or maybe 30 minutes. Great wedding. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I got a lot of love in my hearts for weddings. Santino Corleone doing work. <laughs> you should, people, go, people should go out and buy the book. A lot more into Santino. Absolutely. Uh, Jackson, you didn't come here, though, to talk about Santino's size. I'm, I'm always, I, will, I could talk Godfather for hours. Okay. But instead, I'm going to talk about women's college hoops. Because last night... And truly, like, I, I, this is not a, a, a bit here. Uh, you're not doing a sketch. You're not doing a bit. And I don't mean to, you know, kind of ESPN panel show it here, but I'm going to no. say it. Last night was one of, if not the most important nights for women's sports in modern history. Wow. I mean, I, 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 don't, think it's, uh, I don't think it's that crazy of a take because you had people legitimately, like, hang on the edge of their seat waiting for last night's game between Iowa and LSU. And then not only that, UConn, USC to follow. And uh, I thought that was really awesome game, for, at least for the first half. And then for, I'd say, a good amount of second half. Lived up to the hype. Uh, great performances by Kaylin Clark and Angel Reese. Uh, a lot of fun. I, I really enjoyed watching it. I wanted to know what you thought of the game, if it lived up to the hype, and uh, if the star power of the women's game is really what's transcendent when you compare it to the men's game. Um, I was super interested in the game. We were at the Blues game, mm -hmm. and we watched uh, the second half of the uh, Iowa-LSU game together, and, uh, and a bunch of people were gathered around uh, the phone to right. watch the Iowa LSU game together. And I don't know if I can recall that happening for a women's college basketball game ever. Uh, that, I, I don't know if I would agree with women's sports as a whole, because I think then you'd be kind of ignoring some. Oh, I, I don't mean to disparage any. Like, I know World, you're World disparaging. Cup I just feel like you kind of Greenberged it a little bit. You were lost it a little bit. But Greenberging is different than Orlowskiing. <laughs> Greenberg, you need more Greenberg. Greenberg knows better. <laughs> <laughs> I really liked that. But either way, it doesn't matter where it ranks. I was super interested in yeah. it. And last night we were talking about it because I didn't get a chance to fill out a, a, an office pool. I, I asked you, so does Iowa, who do they play next? But they, they play UConn next. Right. I was, I was confused. I thought thought, they, yeah. So you could have, I mean, you could have, as far as the two NCAA tournaments, you could have UConn against Purdue. And you could have undefeated South Carolina against Caitlin Clark. I mean, yeah. What else could you ask for in each one of them? Perfect. Literally perfect. It really, truly is. Couldn't I mean, have... if you don't have any local interest, I yeah, know exactly. Illinois fans don't necessarily feel like it's perfect. Missouri sure. fans moved on months ago, <laughs> uh, as did St. Louis University fans for that matter. But as far as seeing the two top teams and the star power, I mean, you do have star power with Zach Eady on the men's side. And don't get me wrong, UConn has star power, but I think UConn is more known as their team yeah. brand. Yep. And South Carolina is the team brand, undefeated, going up against Caitlin Clark. I, what else could you ask for? Yeah. So all due respect to both NC State men's and women's teams outside of North Carolina and plenty of people who enjoy Tar Heel Blue are pulling for the other teams as well. For sure. But I don't want to see them win their games. Nothing against them. Yeah. I just want to see. I want to see Zach Eady go up against UConn, and I want to see Caitlin Clark go up against undefeated South Carolina. And I will go out of my way to watch all of them. Yes. And I don't know when the last time I watched a excitedly watched a men's national championship game. I know you do, but I think you are actually more an outlier yeah. at this moment with a casual sports fan. Um, but yeah, I would I would excitedly watch both if those are the matchups we get. Yes. And what a terrible buzzkill it would be if it were Alabama against NC State, and if it were I mean UConn's still a powerhouse, albeit not what they once were. 
uh, UConn against NC State on the women's side. I mean, what a debacle. Yeah, yeah. That, that's just the power of stars, man. Like, when you have people like that, I mean, that's what's catapulted the NBA to such levels, the NFL in a number of different ways. Like, when you have real marketable stars who and people what's know. Hurt baseball. Exactly. When you have marketable stars who people know not only on the court, but a little bit about their personal life, there's some, some drama going on, like we have with Caitlin Clark and Angel Reese. When you have real storylines like that, real personality, it really makes well, an people impact. people invest and yes. care in something that they're not a fan of by birth by geographic location or by gambling mm. allegiance i couldn't have cared any less in the whole scheme of things who won between iowa and lsu but once i found out they were playing at 6 p.m i'm like i gotta make sure i'm watching that yeah and that's where i was and that's where i will be uh if an undefeated south carolina team takes on caitlin clark for the national championship and i have never said that um, about a women's NCAA tournament game. If I may nerd out, give me about 40 seconds. Uh, just, you can you can have 40 seconds today, I just want 40 seconds especially to Especially since out. it's the last balloon party for a week. I just love so much that young people in general, women and men, girls and boys both, got a chance to see that game last night because not only was it a great physical battle where you had, you know, Angel Reese is dominant on the boards, LSU is dominant on the boards. But 20 a, rebounds. For it was, yeah, absolutely. 37, cool. what, how many points did Caitlin Clark wind up with? 41. Okay, I don't know why. I guess at one point it was 37. That yeah, free throw. but it was also such a great strategic chess match. The way LSU was trying to chop up the zone, the way Iowa was handling the ball pressure on Caitlin Clark and how she passes the ball and players hit big shots when they need to. That was a real strategic chess match kind of game hidden under a real physical battle and for people or kids especially growing up watching that game last night it's such a like study that game how they did all the how Angel Reese would catch it double team and find someone how Kalen Clark drove to the basket and kicked it out or took it to the rack like that was really really quality basketball that I'm really happy a lot of people got to see because that was a great product Stephen A. Smith right now uh, and, and, you know, he's not acting, uh, is doing his top five box office NBA matchups. Number five, Bird, Dr. J. Number four, LeBron, Steph Curry. Number three, Russell versus Wilt. Number two, Jordan versus Isaiah. I uh, don't agree with that one. Okay, I was about to say, I've, yeah, I don't think that's it. No, who's he going with number one? It's Jordan either Bird. Or Bird, Jordan Magic, Magic and Bird, Bird, Magic, maybe Bron Kobe, but I would say Bird, Magic is the... He, it's what he'll go with. Uh, if it was Mad Dog Russo, it would be like Chamberlain Kareem or something, or Chamberlain Russell. Well, unfortunately, there's a, a seven-minute monologue in between number two and number one, so you might have to wait until we return next Tuesday for us to give you <laughs> number one. How is it not Magic Bird? Well, it's not because there wouldn't be this monologue. There's where I am. Where do you you want to bet Magic Bird? I'm betting it's not. I'll go Bron Kobe. Oh, there Bird it is. Magic. Bird Magic. Oh, you could have gotten me for ten bucks. Yeah. All right. Um... Well, either way, it's not just people polling for Caitlin Clark. Mm -hmm. It's people having emotional investment in either polling for or polling against Caitlin Clark and polling for or polling against LSU, yeah. Angel Reese, Kim Mulkey. Yeah. For every one person who knows the name of Iowa's head coach, who is, of course, Lisa Bluter. There are how many people who know the name Kim Mulkey? Yeah, it's yeah, three X. Yeah. Minimum, yeah, right? right? I mean, right. minimum. I, totally. I would actually go closer to 100. Yeah. Uh, so people either pull four against Kim Mulkey. They pull four against Angel Reese. Yeah. They pull four against Cla Caitlin Clark. That's the key. That's the Vince McMahon model. Mm -hmm. You know, heels and faces, good guys, bad guys. Yep. Uh, so that's what you had last night. I don't think the anticipation will be as high for Iowa UConn as it was for Iowa LSU, even yeah. though it's in the Final Four. Do you agree with that? Yes, yes. Yeah, the the rematch is what people that's wanted what to people see. Wanted. Yeah, and it was and they were treated well. And forty five, forty five at the half. I would have liked to have seen it closer at the end, but whatever. Sure, sure. But that, I mean, that's just that. The, when a chess match, sometimes, you know, and it was great. It was well done. Both sides of the ball, really outstanding basketball game. And I think it actually helps for the rest of the tournament because people watch that and they're like, boy, that was fun. Like, I can't wait to watch Iowa again. I can't wait to watch UConn again. Like, this is a great matchup. Not to mention you got Don Staley on the other side with their undefeated Gamecocks. This is, this is great. It's a great time for basketball uh jackson nope no one knows who any of these people are that's from the 314 and you're behind on the times my man well how do you know that that's a gentleman my person nice uh let's see what we got 
Um, unlike the NBA piddles, that's from five seven three. See, that's and right there is this the the crux of my issue with discourse. When we, when we're bringing something up and, and spotlighting it, you don't need feel the need to tear something else down. It is it is what is plaguing this country. Look at that. It is. It is. A big, this is a resume real segment. Why can't we just appreciate cool things? Like, why does it always have to be an either or? Just appreciate greatness and respect it and love it. Like, it's... how about this one? This will this will lift your spirits because I see you. I see you sinking. <laughs> we had our whole extended family watching slash texting during that game last night. It was a great game. That's from the six three six. And that's that's what it's all about. That's what sports are all about: bringing people together, having fun doing it, appreciating the game, watching it with your friends and family. Like that's that's what we do it for. That's why we clock in early and we leave late. Uh, nicely done. Uh, get off your damn high horse, Piddles. That comes from the great Bape Auto Detailing, and you know, unfortunately for you, I'm That's in your lockstep guy. with That's him. Your guy. I'll, I'll step down. Yeah, great Bape Auto Detailing. I'm going to miss down. him. I'm going to miss him when I'm out of town. I might text. <laughs> great Bape Auto Detailing, I might just text you while I'm, while I'm out of town. <laughs> uh, all right, uh, we'll take a break. Come back with the final segment of Balloon Party. This is 101 ESPN. Mungadass, St. Louis Acura, Mungadass, Burkhardt, Alton Toyota, presenting sponsor of Balloon Party on 101 ESPN and the 101 ESPN YouTube channel. It's where I go to get my cars. It's where I recommend you go to get your cars as well for new vehicles, for pre-owned vehicles, to get your car serviced. Even if you didn't get your car from Mungadass, just go to stlouisacura.com or altontoyota.com, and they give a secret number for our listeners to call or text with any questions, comments, requests they may have. That number is the following, 314-252-0000. Two nine. Once again, three one four two five two zero zero two nine. Munganess St. Louis Acura. Munganess Burkhardt. Alton Toyota. Online at stlouisacura.com. Online at altontoyota.com. Buying cars, leasing cars, new cars, pre-owned cars. Get your car serviced, even if you didn't get it from Munganess. Go to stlouisacura.com or altontoyota.com.
Welcome back. 101 ESPN, Tim McKernan, Jackson Burkett with you here on the program. Jackson is in the midst of what he's calling Tuesday Topics. Oh, so creative. <laughs> Feeling good about it. Should. It's alliteration. It's all I care about. We had Monday morning, Tuesday Topics. I mean, these things are brilliant. That's what I would say. Uh, I have a macro question about covering the sport of baseball. Okay. You've covered, what is it, 25 baseball seasons in St. Louis? At this point in your career? Yeah, I suppose so. 25 baseball seasons. How do you approach discussing a baseball season that is so long? And Did curious? you just come up with this, or is this in reference to the way I was talking in the second segment we talked Cardinals last No, week? I came up with this earlier today. Tip of the cap to you. Thanks, Tip sir. of the cap to you. Yeah, so approaching the discussion of baseball season, it's so long and carries the, the volume of sample size it does. How do you differentiate bad and good stretches and sustained performance? Has there been seasons where your assessment of a team at the start of the season was night and day different than the end of the year? Um, I, the, the, the last question, absolutely. I enjoy this because, um, I mean, there, there are a couple of teams in my lifetime. I'm not saying that these were the best, but these were my three favorite Cardinal teams, mm -hmm. and none of them won the World Series. Well, one of them kind of did, the 1985 Cardinals, um, then the 2004 Cardinals, and the 2009 Cardinals. And... The 1985 Cardinals, because of the controversial way that all went down, it's viewed through the lens of one thing, and also you have to be at least in your 40s to even remember that, and probably late 40s for that matter. Um, so let's talk 2004 Cardinals. The fact that they were swept by the Red Sox may color that team's memory for a lot of people. I don't think it necessarily does because they got to the World Series, and it was the first World Series for the Cardinals in 17 years. Plus, it was chock full of Hall of Famers, and also... By the time they got there, the rotation really was nothing special. Uh, they were kind of on fumes. Chris Carpenter wasn't a part of that that rotation. He'd gotten hurt a little earlier before the postseason started. So when they lost, it wasn't like that shocking. I think the fact they got swept was what was so eye-opening. The 2009 Cardinals was the only year where you had Wainwright and Carpenter both healthy. And I thought that team was a world championship team. And it also had Pujols and Holiday. Uh, in addition to Ryan Ludwig, who was a different guy at that time and a difference maker at that time. So with all of that established, um, I would imagine most people don't even think of the 2009 Cardinals because of the fact that they got knocked out in the first round and that a lot of people will say the 2004 Cardinals were the best team. And yet it was the 82, 2006, and 2011 Cardinals that have won the, the World Series in the last 40-plus years. Uh, as far as uh, an opinion changing, it, it's so... I don't know. I guess the word I would use is boring to me to overreact to things, but I also know that that's kind of the game because you just play to that. And but I, you know, I also recognize it, and you know, I to each their own on things. Some some people like things, some people don't like other things, right? right. Pro liberty. So, like, I'm not going after the Cardinals won last night. Man, I think this is a great team. And they lose tonight, and then I come in and go, man, this team sucks. Right. You know, and just do that for – it's it, it exposes your credibility, and then you just become, a, you know, a bit of a joke. Um, and you don't really have – I mean, for those paying attention, I suppose, a whole lot of uh, juice. Um, so it's it's – you evaluate a process, and the 2004 Cardinals would be a perfect example of it. You could see, even though their record wasn't great, that the makings of a really good team, not a 105-win team, I want to make that clear, but a really good team was there even when they were 500. And on the other side of things, for example, I think a lot of Blues fans, people who pay close attention, have been saying throughout the course of this year, this team really is is held together with tape that is Jordan Bennington and, to an extent, Joel Hofer. Uh, they are held together by their goaltending and what Jordan Bennington is doing in particular. And is that a real sustainable model? Right. If the Cardinals were to get Sonny Gray back, the hamstring calms down, and he is even 80% of the guy he was in Minnesota last year, and, I mean, we're doing a lot of hypotheticals here. But if Lance Lynn, Kyle Gibson, I guess Zach Thompson would be out of the rotation at that point, but then mm -hmm. Steven Matz were to pitch more often, and by that I mean, let's say, 75% of the time, like they have to date, even though I don't think Lynn's start was great. Uh, I know the numbers show it, but if you watch the game, I don't think you necessarily thought that was a great start. Um, 
that you go, well, that now the floor is lifted exponentially. But that means that a bunch of guys would have to do a bunch of things that they have not done historically right. at a point in their careers when you don't improve. So logic tells me that that is not going to happen. So even though they have looked good one turn through the rotation, I don't go, where are all the Cardinal haters now? It would be disingenuous, it's, right. and it's not the way for me that I operate, but I'm not saying the way that I operate is right and everybody should do it. Everybody can do their own damn thing, but I've just seen it enough to know that you can pick up trends and uh, the trends are what tell you in particular with baseball because of the, the sample size. So to date, the trend that has been most encouraging is the rotation, but you're talking about one start for the rotation that is not enough to go okay this rotation is fixed so from that standpoint um you know i, I think uh, the cardinals are um you know still jackson's on the phone that's why i'm now in a weird sorry, spot i couldn't be sorry <laughs> <laughs> we're back baby okay yeah no i'm, I'm with you i hear what you're saying it, it, baseball is a game maybe more so than any other sport that we talk about that requires most nuance when discussing it because of the sample size of games. I mean, I'm talking about the factors that the guys who actually make money betting it or building daily fantasy lineups are not like what you see on Twitter or right. what even somebody on sports talk radio says. Mm -hmm. That's not where, you know, the money's made. The money is made in the data. It's boring, though. And I don't really spend a whole lot of time breaking that down. Number one, I'm not sophisticated enough with it to be able to project. But, you know, I mean, for example, there were two games yesterday, one at Wrigley, one at City Field in Queens, that were as close as you can get to locks when it comes to being low scoring. And it's it had nothing to do with the starting pitchers, although the Cubs had their new pitcher out there and the, and the Mets had Mania making his first start. But put them down in Texas in that warehouse, and I wouldn't necessarily be saying that game is going to go low. The winds are blowing in. It was freezing. The ball doesn't travel as much. You don't go, oh, Sean Manaya now is in the mix for the Cy Young. Look what he did. He struck out eight Tigers and held them in check. You also have to look at the conditions. You also have to look who he was pitching against. Uh, you know, so, I mean, but but also, I don't, I don't know if people necessarily want to hear that. Right. You know what I mean? Like, that's not the stuff that people want to hear like takes and screaming so and Mazalek wears a cardigan around his neck and talks with big words and then that riles people up and I understand it because I'm in this world but you know that's also not the way that the games are won <laughs> <laughs> right so we talked about uh, we've talked about guy who figures out take midway through take that's me right now oh is that right you're, you're discovering a take well based on what we just talked about the nuance required or what you just said right there about how you know people don't want to hear that. i think maybe part of the reason as we talked about also earlier that the lack of marketable stars is a big reason but maybe why baseball is falling a tad in popularity is because it's the, one of the harder games to sensationalize when you're in the discourse of it. You know, when you have a football game and you have a great performance by Patrick Mahomes in, in one game, it's like, oh, here's the GOAT. Whereas, like what, like you're going to pull out Aaron Judge's two-month splits? Right. And well, for like, example, the Pirates are 5-0 and right now. Right. The Brewers are 3-0. and I don't think there's anybody going, wow, is this the year for the Pirates? No. Because you recognize where things are. Yeah. With that established, if the Cardinals were 0-5 right now, can you imagine yeah. Oh, yeah. what things would sound like? Yep. The Yankees are off to their best start since 1992. And they had to do that by winning four games in Houston. That's a different operation. Houston gets rid of the Yankees, and then uh, Ronel Blanco throws a, a no hitter last night against yeah. Toronto. Yeah. So that just you know, so that that carries a little more weight than say the Pirates beating the Marlins for right. four in Miami. But yeah, you you play. For every one football game, you're playing 10 baseball games. So right. you understand the math on it. But I, I, but I also understand this. It's not what people want to hear, you know. Mm -hmm. But then at the same time, then what you get is red meat that is just, you know, not, not necessarily accurate, but bombastic. Yes. So I, under, I, under, I understand it. I get it. And trust me, I have been guilty of it. That's the other thing. <laughs> right. I, this, isn't, uh, this isn't coming from moral high ground. This is just after years looking in the mirror and going, okay, you know, this isn't, this isn't the way that things wind up working out. Uh, Jackson, it's time for us to go. Uh, BK and Ferrario are up next. I will be out of town. Josh Innes will be filling in tomorrow and Friday uh, and Monday also. I am back on Tuesday. And then the opening drive is going to do four hours on Thursday.
Thursday for opening day as 101 ESPN is live from Ballpark Village at the Budweiser Brew House. For Jackson Burkett, I am Tim McKernan. This has been Balloon Party on 101 ESPN.